Hello, welcome to Us Wargamer. I'm your host, Rob. And the FAQ, or a FAQ, a stealth FAQ, has been released for Age of Sigmar 4. So this is not a balance update. Games Workshop have committed, although a little bit gingerly, about having quarterly balance updates for Age of Sigmar. They have in the past kind of committed to the schedule, but not fully committed to the schedule. And sometimes they've missed the Battle Scroll updates by up to three months, which has been pretty tragic. However, if you are an Age of Sigmar 4 fan, there have been some fairly big, not changes, but clarifications that if you are really invested in making sure your games uh, flow exactly the way you want them to, like the rules say, then you're going to need to absorb, and I'm going to try and run you through in this video. But... There's nothing in here that I think me that if you're just like, I'm just a casual guy, I just want to hang out and play some games, you do not need to worry about what we're about to talk about. This is just some nitty gritty detail when it gets to those fringe cases. And you might be interested to see how they do. And we're going to go through those now. These are all located on the Warhammer community website, as well as in a big unified document. They've also updated the app with many of these changes, and they've also changed the battle packs which are on their website to some of these changes as well. If you have bought the cards that they sell, then some of those cards might be a little bit different now, but you can just use a pen or something uh, to change this around. I'm going to try and go through those now. Hopefully this is a helpful video. Let me know in the comments below if it is, or if there's a way or a format in which I could do it in the future that's more helpful to you. But I'm just trying to help you navigate some of these, because honestly, some of them are a little bit complicated for, for me. Mental fortitude fund. You got this, bud. Oh, thank you to Camel Spider Dave. I'm also doing this with the Twitch chat. And me and the Twitch chat are all having a little bit of a breakdown about it as well. So this is like a collaborative process to hopefully bring you a useful, helpful video that you can enjoy. Okay, so we're going to dive straight in, straight in, and we're going to look at some of these. First one, we are on page 41 of the FAQ, if you want to follow along at home. The first two new updates are just talking about the fact that some abilities that you'll see located on War Scrolls at the top will have different colors. What do those colors mean? Guess what? They're a vibe. They're not a guideline. They're not even a hard and fast rule. If it's red, which is combat, it doesn't have to be the combat phase. And if it's green, which isn't even any phase then that means a defensive ability, which they've never really covered. So the colors that you see are more of a vibe. Colorblind would be easier than actually following the colors. So just read what the abilities say when they say to use them. And if they don't say when to use them, just ask a friend. Uh, okay. The next, next one here is a little bit confusing and probably needs some clarification, which I know you're going to laugh at, but here we are. And someone in the comments will be like, actually, it makes perfect sense. But seeing as I do this professionally, and I think it's a little bit unclear, I'd argue that it's probably going to be a little bit unclear to most people. That seems like a fair thing. But I will say I am also pretty dumb. The ability, well, the the FAQ is, or the question, if my opponent uses a reaction to an ability, e.g. all-out attack, I pass on using a reaction, and then my opponent uses a second reaction, e.g. a faction-specific ability, could I then use a reaction, or I miss my chance because I passed the first time? You can use a reaction. Even if you passed on a reaction earlier, you still have the opportunity to use a reaction after your opponent. Now, while the, quest the question is very specific, can I use a reaction if someone uses two different reactions against me and I pass, the answer, unfortunately, overrides the question a little bit. And what it said is, even if you passed on using a reaction earlier, you would still have the opportunity to use a reaction after your opponent. So if you take that, I guess, out of context of the question, which would be a mistake, this is basically saying you could just keep passing. A good, a bad example would be, um, I attack, I don't do all that attack, they do all that defense, and then I decide to do all that attack. That would be a way around to do it. Or, uh, so th there's a there's a kind of like thing there uh, that, that would happen. But I think, I think this is being very specific about your opponent using two reactions in sequence and then you doing a second reaction, right? That's what it's doing. But, this isn't something that is in is in the core rules, and they haven't uh, produced a very well documented reaction tree. So that's a graphic I think I might try to make. It'll probably make me want to. I won't enjoy doing that, but I'll try and do that just for you guys at home. Uh, next one, picking targets. So this is an important one because up here they they didn't write a very good rule for obscuring terrain. So at the top, the picking targets one, um, and so this is fixing the problem that they made with the obscuring rule. 
When making shooting attacks, can all models in the attacking unit shoot even if the target unit is not visible to some of those models? With the current obscuring rules that you use for terrain, the answer would be yes. However, no. The only models in the attacking unit that can make shooting attacks are those that target the unit is visible to. So, this is overriding what that rule says, or if any, no, it's, it's kind of stapling or plastering on an additional rule. So even though what well, the obscuring rule does say that, they've now chained, they've added a plaster on top of it versus changing the obscuring rule, if that makes sense. Uh, the next one, the attack sequence is also another big change. What this is effectively saying is, is if I hit, if I have crit hits on sixes and then I get crit hits on fives, but I've been made minus one to hit, so I only hit on sixes, would I still get crit fives or would I only get crit sixes? So, you know, ignoring crits at all, where you roll a six to hit, if I'm been made, if I'm hitting on fives and I've been made minus one to hit, what happens when I roll uh, a six, uh, a five to hit? Will you miss? Cool. But when they're crits and I can crit on fives, what happens then? Well, unfortunately, there isn't a uniform answer. The answer is that if you have crit two hits or crit auto wound, those will still be considered misses and those abilities won't proc or they won't activate. The crit the crits on sixes will, but the crits on fives won't. However, if you have crit mortals, they will crit hit, even on fives or even on sixes. So unfortunately, they didn't provide a uniform answer and instead there's multiple answers. Next one, slain models. Do models resume, removed as a result of being out of currency count as being slain? Yes. Reason that that is important because other abilities that happen in the game sometimes react off a unit, a unit or a model being slain. So that happens there. The next two rules are sensationally wordy and they are something that you have to take into account with each other. This is strike first and strike last and also uh, and how that works. In Age of Sigmar, there's lots of units, little heroes that have an ability that let a unit of their type fight immediately after them. But on the, in the core rules, in the strike first and strike last section, there's a little section on the side that you can go find and it says that if a unit has got strike first, so your hero, what happens, uh, like, you cannot bring a unit from the strike medium step or the strike last step up to fight at its step. So you can never move them up or down. There are three phases in combat. Strike first, strike medium, and strike last. Okay? And then people have asked lots of questions about that, even though that's sensationally self-evident about how that works. And so, Games Workshop now have kind of changed it around a little bit in these two different uh, clarifications, I guess. So let's go and work out how it now works. Strike first and strike last. Can I use an ability that allows a friendly unit that does not have strike first to fight immediately after a friendly unit that has strike first if there are one or more enemy units with strike first that have not been picked to fight? The answer would be no. So I've got strike first, my opponent's got strike first, I fight with my unit, and then it says that I have a, another unit that can fight immediately after my first unit then their strike unit, their strike first unit will go before that happens. That's what that ha that's what it says. As mentioned in the sidebar in 19.0 in the rules, abilities that allow a unit to fight ability immediately after another unit do not override strike first constraints. So you cannot pick a unit that does not have strike first to fight until all units, other units have strike first of four. So that is kind of like uh, uh, clarifying everything that happens with uh, in the core rules. But the next question, if a friendly unit is the only unit that has strike first on the entire battlefield and it has an ability that allows a friendly unit to fight immediately after it, in what order would the units be picked to fight? Well, this would change depending on who has the who is the active player, like whose turn it is. If you're the active player, the unit that has strike first would fight first. Then you could use the ability to allow another friendly unit to fight immediately after it. And then you would pick the next unit to fight i.e. three friendly units would fight back to back. So we'll just stop there for a moment. So what they've said now is they've introduced a new step or phase. So the fight immediately after, so strike first and then fight immediately after, that does not go into the, uh, the alternating activations. And instead it becomes this kind of nebulous non-space where you fight immediately after, but it doesn't count as an additional activation. And because you're the active player, so we're in the strike first step, so we strike with our strike first unit, then the immediately after unit enters the nebula space, then we go down into the next phase, which is the strike medium step, and then what happens is 
you as the active player get to strike first. If that makes sense. You get three activations in a row because you've entered a unit into a nebulous new space where it's not strike first, but it is kind of immediate before the phase in which it fights. And that is a change because previously I would have read it as you strike first and then even as the active player, you would strike there. Okay? I hope that is clear. I've tried really hard to make that clear. If your opponent is the active player, the unit that has strike first would fight first. You can still use the ability to allow another friendly unit to fight, and then your opponent would pick the next unit to fight. So the way that works is they get us, like they're still, and it's the same thing I just said, they are still in that nebulous strike first, but not pseudo strike first place. So if the opponent is active, you would strike first. Your nebulous unit would strike at that step as well, but but not with strike first, in quotation marks. And then because it's the opponent's active turn, when you go down to the next step, the medium step, they would activate the next unit. So you got you've got a nebulous a nebulous bus buff there. So that's the that's the first page. So on the next page, we find out some very simple things. Number one, can I affect a companion ability if it uh, with some special buffs? Even though companion ability specifically says no, and the answer is no, unless it says you can, which is pretty simple. Just a nice clarification. Now the next one, next ability is called once per timings, and it's twenty eight point two. And what it's doing is clarifying in this incredibly wordy thing is clarifying that the player, because you have abilities used by units and ability used by the player, and it's clarifying how often a player can use an ability versus how often units can use an ability. And if a player can use an ability more than once. And that's what it's clarifying. It's quite complex, but don't stress too much about it because honestly, it's not going to come up. Uh, next up, there's been a quick update to both ter Faction Terrain and also Regiments of Renown, saying that Regiments of Renown can't gain uh, artifacts or uh, special uh, spells for regiments and stuff. Uh, the big change here is uh, in the Magic 2.0 spells section. Uh, this change is a third paragraph to enemy reactions can only be used if the casting roll equals or exceeds the spell's casting value. So as long as the spell is not unbound, then it is successfully cast, resolve its effect. So what does this mean? Well, okay, specifically, Seraphon have got the ability to once per battle add an additional d6 to their casting value. So if I was to cast a spell on two dice and fail it, you wouldn't be able to attempt to unbind it because you've passed the step where you can attempt to unbind it. I can then roll a d6 and add that to the casting value. So that is a very specific situation where you can't make the unbind reaction unless your opponent actually successfully casts a spell. That's what that means. Uh, and that probably also has some other abilities that are knocking out there, like if you successfully unbind something, you're going to be able to do some mortal damage or something like that somewhere in the game. It's probably relating to those sorts of abilities. Uh, but your opponent needs to be successful in order for you to make a reaction with magic. Next up, we're going to look at some really fun stuff to do with terrain. The first thing we're going to look at, though, is running, or more importantly, a run versus the run. In the commands movement phase commands, if an ability modifies a run roll, that ability, does that ability modify the roll made in the redeploy ability since redeploy has the run keyword? The answer is no. Named roles, such as the run roll, are only modified by abilities that specifically call out that type of role. Why is this important? Well, this actually comes up several times across the course of the game. And that's specifically because you have the ability and a ability. As an example, you have the fight ability, which is very different to a fight ability. As an example, if you were to look at Neve Black Talon, Neve has got a fight ability which works almost exactly like the fight ability um, that you have in uh, in Age of Sigmar, like the normal fight ability. However, it's a fight ability, not the fight ability. And so, what you do have is you have multiple unit, multiple rules which have keywords like run, but they are a run ability, not the run ability. The reason that's important is because sometimes you'll think that you have the ability to affect. Uh, an ability, but you can't, uh, or you can because it's an ability or versus the ability. So just be conscious of that. Is it calling out the ability, like retreat is the ability, or is it calling out uh, an ability? I know that sounds so dumb to say. I'm so sorry. I've got to say that out loud. But that is that's what that's referencing. Next one, can a unit use a covering fire command after the redeploy command? The answer is yes. Why is that? It's because covering fire 
Covering fire doesn't act like you can't select a unit to be the part of it. It's, it's a long story. The answer is yes. Like, but that 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 does work. It worked before, uh, but I don't think they should let that happen. I guess. Um, anyway, commands and end of turn commands. Your models, uh, when using power through, command models pass through enemy models. The answer is you can, models can only do that if you have the fly keyword. Okay. Uh, and then next up, uh, your terrain. And there's three different rules or clarifications on if you can or can't claim cover when targeting units across the terrain. You do not need uh, me to clarify that for you. You can work that out. It's not very complicated. It's just explaining, is your unit behind cover or not cover, and can it get minus one to hit? Our next two uh, rules that we're going to look at are updated rules. The first one is about magic and power level. And if you have a, something that's a wizard and a priest and you're able to either increase or decrease the power level of that wizard or priest, unless it specifically calls out whether or not it affects wizards or priests, then it's going to both increase or decrease either of those two power levels. Which units are wizards and priests? I think only in unique situations. Artifacts can be taken as an example where you can choose between one or the other, but being able to add plus one to their power level or minus one to their power level is going to affect both of those two power levels and not just a single one. They've also updated whether or not a manifestation can gain any benefits from friendly abilities with the exception of banished manifestation. And the answer to that is no. Uh, and that's because... Uh, that's because some people have tried to use like things like keywords and abilities to try to give manifestations better saves or other uh, other like bonuses. But basically, you can't affect a manifestation unless it's with banish manifestation. That's the very simple. Can they use commands? No, no. Everything's an ability, and you can't use them on manifestations. The next one is army composition. Uh, when using an army of renown, can I pick a faction train feature to include on my roster? Yes, unless that army's renown specifically states that you cannot include a faction train feature. They forgot to do that uh, because some armies are very, very very much need their faction terrain. Next up, we have updates for some of the manifestations. And even though many, many people online were being told at Warhammer official events by Games Workshop employees that you would be able to move the Purple Sun suffocating Gravetide into combat, and like one Soul Seeker, turns out they were wrong. Or that person lied, which is not a shock. And you cannot. So Purple Sun, Suffocating Grave Tide, like one Soul Seeker, cannot end their moving combat, which is what the flight keyword does already say. However, Aether, Aether Void Pendulum can, because it needs to do that to be able to do its damage in combat. That's the update. It's very clear. It's very simple. It's already how it worked. But now they've added that into the rules so you can see it more clearly. So as well as those core changes, there's been updates to many of the different factions. Well, not massive updates, some tiny, tiny little uh, instrumental changes. Uh, so the first one for Cities of Sigmar is you cannot choose the same unit to move more than once uh, with their advanced information ability, which is obviously dumb uh, to do before. And they also updated hammers, but I think they did that last time. Next up with Fire Slayers, they changed the battle trait a little bit uh, to once per battle army in your movement phase. Now, the big change is in Hedonites of Sinesh, where they've changed how Phantasmagoria works. While it's a complicated spell previously, it kind of had some really fun interactions. Now it's just kind of okay sometimes, um, and is honestly not very good. What, what they've changed it to is you pick a target unit, and once that target enemy target unit, once that enemy target unit has chosen to use a fireability and then has fought, you can pick a friendly Sinesh unit to make a 2d3 inch move, right? It could pass through combat ranges of enemy units and can end that move in combat. The reason this was kind of cool before is your opponent would choose to use a fight ability, then you would Phantasmagoria 2d3 inches, which means you could maybe make it so they could hit you with less units, or if you can move far enough away, they might not be able to even hit you, which would be pretty cool. But now they've changed it so that they get to do the full hit and then you get to move away, which is much worse. Uh, but it's still not a useless ability. Casual Overlords, they've changed the Arcanaut Frigate ability uh, on the Assault Boat. I mean, I don't even know what that does, or no one cares, because KO are having a very tough time. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, KO players. Explain it to me in the comments. I'm sure it's a tragedy, whatever they've done to you, but it's pretty rough. Lumineth, they've changed the Lightning Reaction ability, where you can fight with two units in the combat step, and the reason they've changed it, if they've changed it to Lumineth Realm Lord units, uh, keyworded, that means you can't choose manifestations to fight two, with two manifestations uh, instead of having to pick Lumineth units, which is the big change. And then Maggotkin, they've changed it so the battle trait isn't going to be able to use 
um, the ability to spread disease from manifestations or from terrain pieces, which again is a good change. So all of these are like good kind of instrumental changes, which I hate what they've done with Heat Knights of Slash. Then we've got some updates for some of the others. Uh, Hex Rates have been changed to control characteristic one, but they still have run and charge with an unrendable save and are incredibly cheap. So <laughs> I don't think that's the change we need to see. And ultimately, the Dreadblade Harrows are probably the real problem, uh, which is fine. There's an update. There's an update to Morgast getting the fly keyword and Mortis Guard getting a change on uh, their ward roll of one to unmodified ward roll of one, which is fine. The Scar Vet has got a little bit of a clearing up on its Agrodon Lancers. Um, Stormcast's Dias Arcanum has got a little bit of an update. Lord Imperitant has had its rule change. None of these are a big deal. They're just clarifications and fixing some of the things that they did wrong previously. The Raptorix has also had a change as well. The last page is a little uh, FAQ section, an actual FAQ section. Daughters of Cain, can I use all out slaughter on multiple units? Yes. Um, Gits, can I use the Bouncy Fury ability on companion weapons? Yes. LRL, can I use the same facet of tw war twice? No. And Scenari Calligrave, um, can I avoid miscast with Realm Scribe? The answer is no. So what is this update? This feels like very much a kind of an editorial pass, a late editorial pass. What were some of the problems that we accidentally didn't write? You know, um, what mistakes did we actually not get in the editing process before we sent them off to print? You know, what things did we miss, as an example? Like one of the ones that we haven't featured here is as something I covered when I did the Beast of Chaos review is that the Beast of Chaos, they forgot to give them melee weapons to the Centigors. They've now added that in. Good. Really simple, nice little thing. So this isn't a balance patch, a balance pass. This isn't an FA. This isn't a genuinely just a clearing up of some of the rules. And in some cases, some instrumental changes to how some things have worked. Um, like with Phantasmagoria, as an example, with a strike first, strike last, that could actually be fairly impactful in the game. A little bit of clarity on some of those manifestations. So a pretty long... Uh, review of stuff that is very micro changing. I did say that at the start of the video. So these aren't huge. These are important clarifications in some cases. Um, and in some cases, they're things people are going to be able to utilize to try to play games better. But ultimately, I'd like to see these be much more represented. It's taken me a long time. It's taken me a couple of hours with the chat to really nail down some of those changes and how they work specifically. And I would love, I would have loved to have seen Games Workshop to include pictures, diagrams, and a little bit more of an explainer because ultimately the thing that they don't do, which I guess is what I do for a living, is they don't try to make this really navigable to an audience. They don't try to make this so that you're like, like, and look at the way that they present the information as well. Like, you know, there's not like a, it's just some quick answer as opposed to like, these are the reasons why we did it. These are the ideas that we were having. Here's the situations in which they work. Here's a picture. And I think it's because ultimately they don't really provide excellent support for their gaming. They don't want to. They do provide some support. Some people might get really mad at me in the comments and just be like, Rob, they provided an FAQ. That's amazing. They've really answered a bunch of questions. I really feel that that could go much further, right? Like they could have a community manager whose entire job was to try to make it so that people could explain, understand how to play these games better. Because ultimately, if people are playing their games and having more fun, then they're going to sell more minis. It feels like a really direct correlation, which they've never really understood. And I feel like I'm going to, and if you are going to keep watching my content, I'm always going to be, I'm really passionate about the game, but I'm always really going to be frustrated about Games Workshop's uh, relationship with managing the game. Both uh, stats and meta analysis and or meta um, changes in their FAQ documents and also balance updates are all going to be something that probably I'm always going to pick fault with because I'm very passionate. I'd always want them to go further, do more, try harder, deliver more information and deliver information better. That's hopefully something I'm always going to be able to bring to the table as well. But it's frustrating that I have to do it and I can't just be more of an enjoyer of the game uh, rather than I'd much rather be doing tier lists and other stuff than, uh, you know, having to decipher what it is they were trying to, like, do here. And you got to remember, I've also developed a lot of system mastery to be good enough at the game to be able to decipher this. If you're just a new player, you might be like, what the fuck does that mean? And guess what? It doesn't matter. Just go roll your dice. Get your rules wrong 
tons. Yeah, as long as you're rolling dice and having fun, that's the main part. And that's a big FAQ for me. Frequently asked question, how can I enjoy myself when there are big FAQs? Just fucking ignore them and go play games. After that, if you want to get really serious, come back to videos like this. But before then, go enjoy yourself. Thanks for watching my video. See you soon.